Right. So before before we start, I <clears throat> I would like you to zoom back some 20 years and uh, imagine the internet. Okay, 20 years ago, what was the internet? It was Ethernet cables, that's what we did, right? So you remember the days when you were mounting the Ethernet cable on the dorms and trying to connect your computer? Yes, you had a, you know, a, something on your computer you used clearly to browse it, but the, the whole internet was all about the infrastructure, right? Cables, computers, uh, cards, boards, etc. That was what the internet was back then. Now zoom forward 20 years, go out in the streets uh, of Brno and ask the kids, what's the internet to them? They will tell you Facebook, eBay, right, LinkedIn, whatever, uh, but not cables. We totally forgot the underlying infrastructure. This is great. We have undergone a massive transformation, which is going from an infrastructure-based design to an opportunity and service-based design. Okay, this is what the internet has really gone through. And the internet is not the fixed internet is not the only internet we have been designing ever since. And um, we've come through some really interesting. Um, internet's ever since, let me see if that works. Yeah. Um, and that would be the mobile internet, right? So after the fixed internet came the mobile internet. We started long ago, but now everybody is using it. You're using on your iPhone, using on your laptop, using on your iPad. So the mobile internet has become really a fabric of our daily lives. And we're almost there. That transition from an infrastructure base to a purely service and opportunity base is almost there with the mobile internet too. The only time you do remember that there is a cable there, well, the cable isn't a cable, it's a wireless thing, right? But the only time you remember it is there is when you go from 4G to 3G, right? So 4G is so powerful, it gives you such a massive data rate that it's just as if you're using your iPad on, on, the, on the Ethernet cable, right? And the switch only occurs if you go down and you look up to this little logo and you see 3G and you say, oh gosh, I'm back to my old Ethernet cable, okay? But we're there. Things are happening and we're trying to make it even better. Now in 5G, we want to up it by a further one or two orders of magnitude when it comes to data rate. So currently, 4G can do quite a lot, and strictly speaking, as per IMT Advanced, we haven't reached the 4G capabilities yet. They're coming with carry aggregation. I have seen download rates of a gigabit per second, one gigabit per second with 4G, right? So if we want to do 5G, this needs to be 10 gig or 100 gig. And then you sit down, and you're like, how do you do that, right? So from a tech point of view, I'll leave that to you. That's, that's your cup of tea. But we are really concerned about the applications. What type of applications need 10 gigabit per second, 100 gigabit per second? So we sat down and we, we struggled. And the only one we came up with is one which, you know, Gerd Fettweiss shows this quite often here, and I, I added a few of the things. So imagine a stadium. Uh, Camp Nou in Barcelona or Wembley in the UK. Uh, loads of people in there. There's a football game going on there. Cameras everywhere. The players have cameras on their shirts. So there's a company which started by a friend of mine, uh, First Vision in Barcelona. They're putting cameras now on the t-shirts of the football players, right? So you would see in real time how Messi and Ronaldo see the field as they play along. That's really fascinating. Now the thing is here, this data needs to be transmitted very quickly, very low delay. So you can't really compress the data. This is raw stuff going out. So you're transmitting raw data, video data from all the cameras in the field where most of them moving around. And then suddenly you realize there's a huge amount of data rage which needs to be pushed up in the uplink. And then you need to bring it down and broadcast, which is a bit, bit easier to the 100,000 people in the stadium, right? And this is where we realized, hey, maybe we need the 10 gigabit per second or the 100 gigabit per second data rates, which would justify 5G. So we're really excited about it. So I went to the stadium, to Wembley, and we talked to the people and they said, nah, because people actually don't want it in real time. People will sit in the stadium, they're watching the game on the field, and some five, six seconds later, they want to see it on their screen. Five, six seconds give you enough time to leverage on all the video codecs you have on the planet. So you can actually bring it down probably to just about a gigabit per second, okay? So even this application, we don't know. So literally 5G, we just don't know what it will power, but we're not worried about this. We're not worried about this because um, Hans Vestberg, the CEO of uh, Ericsson said something really beautiful. He said, we started designing 3G when the internet wasn't even around. 
okay? It was 1990 something. The internet wasn't really there. I was still mounting my ethernet cables, okay? And we started designing 4G before the iPhone came along. We didn't even know we would need it one day. So now we do 5G, uh, not understanding what we will be doing, but there will be something which will be really useful probably by 2020, 2025, okay? So just go on with it. Do the 10 gig per second or the 100 gig per second. It will be needed for somebody at some point, okay? Now, the uh, mobile internet is not the only internet we've been designing. We went on and we started to design the things internet or the internet of things, okay? And um, we've been doing this for quite a while. It's quite an exciting thing to do. The big surprise is to see things internet or the internet of things in the slide sets of 5G, right? It's a massive surprise. We've been doing this exercise now for a long time. The concept has been invented maybe 25 years ago. Uh, first propriety solutions have been out maybe for 20 years. Then, uh, you know, the first alliances and standards appeared around 2000. Why in 2015 we still talk about the Ethernet cable of the IoT, right? It's a good question. Something has gone wrong. And I want to tell, I want to tell you what's gone wrong. What's gone wrong is that around 2000, um, we realized that one day there will be millions, billions, if not trillions of sensors and actuators which need to be connected. We understood already that there's no way that we can uh, uh, actually cable them, so they need to be untethered, it needs to be a wireless design. We understood already that there's no way that billions of sensors could be recharged on a daily basis like we recharge our phones. So we needed to come up with a truly low power solution, right? So we started designing this, proprietary solution came out, crossbow, those skilled in the arts, etc. IEEE went on to this, so the uh, group 802.15.4 was charted to come up with a really good link layer solution. And they started coming up with some physical layer, in fact there are six physical layers these days, with a medium access control, which was okay. We then improved that medium access control, there's a group 154E, which introduced the time synchronized channel hopping. Uh, which allowed essentially a large field of sensors to be totally synchronized and save a lot of power really when they communicate. So we've done that and then we're like, okay, so we would love now, imagine your sensors would love you to connect to the internet. If you want to be connected to the internet, you need to speak the language of the internet, which is IPv6, right? So that's what uh, the internet speaks. And uh, the problem with IPv6 is, is that the IPv6 uh, packets are that long in my embedded uh, packets, whether it was Zigbee or something else, is that long, right? So how do you go about it? So then ITF kicked in. ITF is another standards buddy, which is responsible everything, internet, routing, connectivity, etc. And they started standardizing the way how we go about this, how we chop down large IPv6 packet into something which is smaller, and how do we compress the already very large header, how do we put security on top, neighborhood discovery, and a few other things. And uh, that was done by uh, ITF6 low pan. So when you hear 6 low pan, this is what it is. It's a standardized way of chopping down IPv6 packets and reassembling them when they come out of the, of the sensor network, okay? Then we said, okay, we have now connected, we, we make them now uh, speak the language of the internet. What else can we do? We would love the sensor network to speak the language of the web. Why? Because we would love to leverage on all the development efforts of the programming skills of all the web programmers on the planet, okay? So just reuse that skill. Instead of training new skills, hey, why don't we use that skill and let them also program stuff for sensor networking applications? So Co-op was born, ITF Co-op, which standardized the way uh, how we talk uh, to the sensor network at application layer, right? So if I had a temperature sensor enabled now, uh, you would reach me via www.mishadola.com slash temperature, okay? We could do that. That's massive. It's really massive. We made essentially a very small embedded device speak the same language as a supercomputer on the other side of the planet. Massive engineering feat. Millions of dollars gone into this. Uh, loads of companies trying to make it happen. The only problem is it doesn't work, okay? It's just a minor detail. Never mind, and uh, there are a few mistakes we've done on the way, and these mistakes I realized when I was still in France Telecom, um, when we started rolling this out. So we were part of the design, we are inside, I was part of the team doing the whole thing, right? Started rolling out, loads of problems. Then I, with my company, which I co-founded, World Sensing, we started rolling this out uh, large scale in cities, refineries, really larger things than just a test laboratory of 10 or 100 nodes. We're talking about 10,000, 100,000 nodes, right? And then suddenly everything changes. Things you thought work, don't. And uh, here are the mistakes we did. First mistake we did is 
we believed in the pitch of low power, which is wrong because power doesn't drain your battery. Energy drains your battery, right? This is what really sucks out the jowls of your battery. This is energy. Power gives you range. What you want is a high power solution to give you a long range and a low energy solution at the same time. Can we do that? You remember your physics days? Very simple. Power multiplied by time is energy. So if you do your job very quickly at high power, the energy you use is more or less the same as if you communicated with Zigbee at low power for a long time. Okay? But the advantage is, you, instead of doing multi-hop and mesh networking, which you as academics love, but we as industrials really hate, because loads of degrees of freedom, a lot of stuff can go wrong, and they go wrong, right? So, therefore, if you could do that, that would be great. So that's mistake number one. It's not low power we needed. We needed low energy. Mistake number two is, we used the wrong spectrum. So this stuff was running over the ISM bands. So the ISM bands are great bands. So license exam bands in general are good bands because they allow you to build things quickly, get it out to the market without big licensing and type of registration type of processes. Uh, so time to market seems to be very, very quick. The only problem is, is that uh, these bands are highly congested. And we realized that in France Telecom already. Back then, we were the world's first to roll out a mesh network, a live Zigbee multi hop mesh network, large scale. Uh, Alpe d'Huez, top of the Alps, worked really well, no problem. We brought it down to Grenoble and it stopped working. Okay? Interference. 2007 that was, 2006. That was 2006. Imagine today. Yeah? So, ISM band is not a good band to be in. And there's actually another reason, even a reason which is worse than just the interference, which is the ability to offer license service agreements. Okay? So, LSA is a very important notion once you get into critical processes. Whether this is your sensor network instrumenting refineries, whether this is your sensor network uh, instrumenting people uh, monitoring heart attacks, whether you're doing anything which is critical and where life is depending on this. And why is it a problem? So I give you the example we really had. So we instrument quite a lot of in that company, the uh, refineries, right? So we have a, a pressure sensor on one of the oil pipelines. And the pressure sensor is to say there's a problem here. And when the problem is too large, um, you would notify a, a, a valve, an actuator, to close essentially the pipeline so the refinery wouldn't blow up. This is what they do. Okay, now here's a problem. So imagine it's a wireless solution, which is a very attractive solution because you roll it out very quickly all over the, uh, the refinery, right? So imagine uh, World Sensing rolls out the, the uh, pressure sensor. It detects a problem. It sends a packet. The packet doesn't arrive because the guy who's taking care of the refinery is watching Netflix, right? So it's totally congested, the Wi-Fi band. Packet gets blocked. Uh, the, the packet, the alert never reaches the ABB valve and the refinery blows up. Who's fault? is it? It's my fault because I own the equipment. Okay? So there's no ability for me to leverage uh, that type of responsibility and accountability in a legally uh, sound way through service level agreements. There's no way of doing that. So this spectrum is not really attractive for critical things. It's okay to transmit the uh, temperature of your home. It's not critical. Well, unless it's burning, I don't know. Or, you know, the, the water level of your cactus, whatever. So these type of things are okay. But once it becomes really interesting, where there's a really strong business case behind this, ISM is bad, very bad, okay? Now, uh, let's move on. There's more, actually, to this, because we believed in the pitch of uh, low cost. So we were told the Zigbee chips are very cheap. True. 50 cents, very cheap, off the shelf, uh, mass manufactured because it's standardized, no problem. So the only issue is, is you know, once we rolled out a larger network of just 500 uh, or 1,000 nodes, I had to employ two people full time to babysit the network because there are so many degrees of freedom with so many things going wrong, links disappearing, uh, problems here, problems there, right? So two people, annual salary, it's 150,000 euros on top. If you divide this by the number of chips you sold, suddenly your 50p chip is 50 pounds or 50 euros. Okay, And then for me, it's actually cheaper to use a cellular system where I know it works and I have the service, service level agreements, etc., etc. So you need to take the full package into account. So remember this, energy is a problem, not power. ISM bands, 
bad deal for interference and legal reasons. And um, the third one is a total cost of ownership. This needs to be taken into account rather than just a chip cost, okay? So I've been preaching this for quite a while now, since 2010. People wouldn't believe me at the beginning. And um, I still remember a keynote I gave in Sophia Antipolis in front of a very big uh, crowd, standards crowd. And I was hackled by a Cisco guy and I was saying, it's all bollocks what you're saying. Uh, but things uh, moved on, okay? M things moved on now. And um, we have uh, a few systems which have realized there is a problem with connectivity there, okay? So the system number one is the Wi-Fi community. So it started in 2008, a company called Osmo Devices. Uh, 2008 is the year when the iPhone wasn't really yet around, okay? And we were using normal cameras to take pictures. So what Osmo Devices did is they said, hey, we developed a new camera where whenever you take a picture, it's automatically downloaded via to your next Wi-Fi box and being sent as an email wherever you want to have it. And everybody is like, how does that work? 2008, you remember we switched on Wi-Fi on your laptop and half an hour the battery was dead. And there was a small camera living on two AA batteries for years. Nobody understood what happened. So Osmo Devices, what they did is actually they read in great details the dot eleven eight hundred to dot eleven specifications, and surprise, surprise, there was a line there saying duty cycling. You can duty cycle Wi-Fi. You can switch it off, right? That's what they did. Wi-Fi was switched off all the time, except when you took the picture. It switches on, transmits a packet, and because it is, it, it delivers such a high data rate, it can do it very quickly. Transmits the the, the file, goes back to sleep. And that's what the secret source is, right? And uh, the IEEE was so impressed that we started a new standards group called IEEE 800-11 AH. So AH is uh, hopefully will be ratified soon. Uh, we will have first pre-standards chips uh, probably early next year. And that means we will be instrumenting the whole interior world, even the city world, most likely with low power Wi-Fi sensors, right? So there are small, small issues still because it's using the sub gig band today. And in Europe, you don't have a lot of spectrum. So they're thinking of choosing a different band, but they will find a solution. It's very attractive because everybody knows Wi-Fi. It's an active community, security is sorted. Uh, every, all the CTOs and C CEOs, they know about Wi-Fi. So it's a very good solution to be used. So let's see how this plays out. But just to give you an understanding on the capabilities of Wi-Fi, so Bosch did an interesting study in 2012. They compared the energy consumption, so not the power consumption, the energy consumption of a six low pan Zigbee chip compared to a low power Wi-Fi chip, right? And it turns out that Wi-Fi is 10 times more energy efficient. This is massive. So we had a huge community, the Zigbee community, doing nothing else then for 10 years trying to come up with the most brilliant system on the planet and it turns out we had a good system all the time. We could have used it all the time. Anyway, so we are there now. So Zigbee now is slowly going to die out. Uh, Broadcom, the largest uh, chip manufacturer, just announced uh, uh, two years ago that they're going to stop producing the chips. Some people will still be using it, but eventually it will go out. So that seems to be the trend, which uh, I've been predicting since 2010. Zigbee is not the only system which is, um, which, uh, sorry, Wi-Fi is not the only system which managed to capitalize on that. There's another one called Low Power Wide Area Networks. Okay, so that's a fairly new one. I don't expect you to know about it, but I want to give you um, a tease on the capabilities of that technology. So when my CEO was landing in Paris with one of our uh, sensors and luggage, the sensor would send once an hour in a live message saying, this is my battery, that's my status, this is where I am, etc." right? So whilst he was landing in Paris, that beacon was picked up in Barcelona. It's 900 kilometers, right? 900 kilometers, powering your sensor network and living on a double A battery. That's a revolution. And uh, that is because people capitalized on the three things I just told you before. So therefore, we have new systems coming. That specific system was a Sigfox system. So maybe some of you will have heard of that. Sigfox is one of them. Um, Cicleo uh, 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 is another. So Cicleo was bought by Semtech and then now that is traded under LoRa, right? So Sig, uh, Sigfox, LoRa, and then we have another company called Newell in, in, in Britain, in the United Kingdom. They tried to do that for many years and they've done something really interesting. They kind of realized that Sigfox uh, 
and uh, Laura communicating in the license exam bands where we have the LSA problem, okay, the license, the license service level SLA problem. So they said, hey, why don't we try this stuff in the license band, okay? Uh, because this is owned by the operator. They have control over this. There's no interference there. So they did a trial in Milton Keynes uh, City, uh, north of London, uh, together with uh, British Telecom, and they showed the feasibility of that. And then suddenly everybody woke up and said, hey, this is a great solution. Um, the only problem is uh, they never really delivered a working chip, right? I've been bugging them for five years, so they never really had a chip which worked, so never really a product. They never really had any customers, okay? And they were acquired by Huawei for $25 million. Now, this should give really hope to you, right? So there's a company, no product, no customers, and still acquired for $25 million. That's great, right? So there's a lot of uh, background there, and I'm sure our next keynote speaker, and we'll talk about this a little bit more because that kind of fanned a whole new, uh, let's say, frictious world in the 3GPP standards committees. And um, I don't want to go into this, but what I personally also see as a long-term solution of connecting all these sensors outdoors on the road, whether these are vehicles, whether these are in the, in the forest, whether that's a refinery, et cetera, is 5G type of technology, right? So there's machine type communication and we have new systems coming, which are called the narrowband LTE and you will hear a lot about this uh, after me. So I don't want to go into this, and I'll leave that to you, okay? So that's a little bit the story about the things in the Nets here. And um, um, we need to see how this plays out, really. We really don't know because the business case is very, very lousy, very lousy actually for the operators. Um, so Telia Sonera, which is one of the more progressive operators on the planet, they have the same amount of SIM cards for people as they have it for things, right? So in Sweden, there are not so many people and uh, there are quite a few things. So therefore, you have the same amount of SIM cards. And what Telia Sonera does in one year with the machines, okay, is what they do in two hours with people. Okay, so if you're a CEO of a company and you see that there's something giving you the bulk of the business and something else is 0.01% of the business, you dump it. That's what you do, right? But they still continue because they see the value elsewhere and there is value elsewhere. The value is not in the data pipe. It's not the value per connectivity. It's clearly somewhere else. And maybe John is going to talk about this. So the things internet. So we have done the fixed internet. We've done the mobile internet. We have done the things internet. Is that it? Okay, is that it? So um, we think it is not. And uh, I got inspired about some two years ago when I talked to Anthony Salim, a billionaire in Asia, a friend of mine who I know from my company, World Sensing. So he said, hey, Misha, you know, I have a, I have a problem. Now, listen to this because maybe you will have that problem one day. So he has a fleet of private jets, okay? And he needs to maintain them. He needs to fly them to Dallas from Indonesia uh, once every now and to get it really serviced. And he said, it's a big pain. I don't want to fly all my jets to, to, to Dallas, uh, but I don't want to build a service station here, right here in Indonesia. Can you do something about this? And this is when I thought, hey, if we combine what we currently have in robotics, what we have currently in artificial intelligence, and we design a really new novel low latency network to connect it all, maybe we can do it remotely. Maybe the best guys in Dallas could service remotely the airplane in Indonesia. And then, and we started working on this within Kings. I called it back then, closing the data cycle. Now, this is not very sexy, I have to admit, uh, but good enough for NSF to pick it up as one of their research items. So we came along, we started using a different term, um, the tactile internet, okay, which was coined by Professor Gerd Fettweis and some of his colleagues in Germany. Uh, under totally different circumstances. So he was thinking about something else. So what we think about is, is uh, using the tactile internet to transmit skills. That's what we want to do. We want our best surgeons in London and Los Angeles to do an operation in Asia. We want to have our best Vauxhall engineers service a car in Africa. Uh, I want to teach somebody how to play the piano. Somebody teaches me how to, how to paint. Right? So that would be a massive change of how we democratize work, labor, right? Skills. Uh, and we need things which we don't have yet. Because what we can do at the moment, we can transmit video. We can transmit audio. That's all one way, okay? And uh, video clearly two ways. But if we want to transmit touch uh, and skills and labor, we need something else. And that's something else we call that the tactile internet, okay? Now it turns out everything is about delay because when you touch something, you wanna, you need to feel 
the reaction to this touch within a very short time. We are still arguing what that time is, but let's stick for the time being uh, to one millisecond, right? So within a millisecond, I need to feel that I've touched my other hand, that I touched the table, right? Uh, if I don't do that, I get cyber sick. So those who do flight simulators, those who do gaming a lot, they know that. If the action reaction is separated by quite some time, you start to get dizzy. So we don't want that. Right? We want a, a, a good and stable network. So therefore, to transmit a, uh, d uh, the signal in very short time is instrumental of making this tactile internet work. Now, one millisecond speed of light and fiber buys you 200 kilometers. Right? So this is 100 kilometers to go and 100 kilometers to come back. So how do you build a global network where a doctor in Los Angeles can do an operation in Africa over these huge distances? Very simple. This is how we do that, breaking physics, okay? Now we're not gonna do that, okay? Take it easy, uh, leave that to my physics department at King's College London. We're gonna do it differently. Um, we're gonna look at the architecture now a little bit in more details, and maybe this is one of my uh, very few technical slides. Yeah, that comes out well, right? So we have a human operator. I want to teach somebody, as an example, how to paint, right? And you have a teleoperator, which either paints or is an extension to the hand and makes you move things. If you think this is science fiction, uh, you're mistaken. So we have gloves today uh, developed by a Danish company, which I can put on, and uh, a master somewhere else puts it on. And as that master plays piano, my fingers start moving on the piano as well, right? So this is coming, this is not fiction. Um, what, what happens? I'm giving a movement signal velocity in one direction is being picked up by my E node B, goes to the serving gateway, packet gateway, goes to out, out of the operator's network, goes into the internet, goes back into the packet gateway, server gateway, E node B, which is the base station on the roof or in the room, <laughs> and goes to the slave robot, okay? The slave robot does something, hits, for instance, now an object. That needs to be transmitted back very quickly, okay? Otherwise, as I told you, I get cyber sick. So action reaction needs to happen in shortest time. Um, right, so if you have only 100 kilometers to go and 100 kilometers to go back, you can't do it. But uh, we started thinking of how to do it. So clearly, you need an ultra-fast network, so you need to make sure that you know, the air interfaces has a new uh, physical layer because currently the physical layer is too slow. Uh, we need a new medium access control. We need a new way of stabilizing the network to give it a high reliability. You need new ways of uh, getting slicing done end-to-end, -end, quality of uh, service end-to-end, etc. So loads of challenges to make this the fastest possible network you can do from a telco point of view. The other thing, though, we believe we need is, and what really made the internet, is we need something standardized at the edges, right? The internet took off because with HTML, we really had some standards there. We had video codecs, we have v audio codecs, and we want to replicate that by building these haptic encoders. So a lot of work has been done, and when you start transmitting haptic signals, right, that is typically composed of a kinesthetic one, which is six degrees of freedom, so the movement and the rotation, and the tactile one, which is touch. So a lot of stuff has been done on the kine kinesthetic one, but very little has been done on the, on the surface, on the touch type of standardization. So we want to, currently with our robotics lab in, in Kings, we're trying to come up with a standardized uh, way of representing this information so we can encode it very efficiently, transmit it, and replicate it. And the standard is important because you want a Siemens uh, uh, haptic device, uh, uh, a Siemens operator here being able to talk to an ABB uh, slave robot, right? That's what you really want to do to scale the edges. So the encoder is really, really important. And a lot of people in Europe and the world have started working on different parts of that. There's Professor Eckhart in TU Munich, which has done some pioneering work. So why the Edge AI? The Edge AI helps us with the delay. Okay, so the delay is really uh, the biggest uh, break, uh, a wall really we need to, to break here. And uh, I want to explain this very quickly here. So it's uh, very simplified just to show you how it works. So what we see is here is, for instance, one kinesthetic degree of freedom. We have the time as it goes by. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a predictive engine running on both ends. Okay, on both ends. On this end here, if I go back, on that end here, in fact, it runs here, and on that end here, which is here, okay? Now, what that predictive engine does is, it is 
trying to understand what is going to be my next move, whether I do surgery, okay, whether I do painting, what is my most likely next uh, move. It turns out that we humans are animals of, of customs and we have a specific way of moving so engines can learn that. There are different uh, mechanisms, we can use simple armor models, more sophisticated machine learning stuff, whatever you come up with. But the idea is to replicate the coefficients on the other end okay and have the predictor run uh, with the real thing all the time until my engine where I'm doing something understands that hey my prediction deviates by a factor epsilon here epsilon is not dramatic yet okay so but it understands I need to retrain my prediction engine I'm starting to retrain that and transmit the coefficients then and then the real action is again back to uh, to my predicted one when actually it would have been a deviation of delta when there would have been a big big massive problem and this is what it buys us the time so i'm not talking about predicting stuff over let's say seconds or hours or days i'm talking about predicting stuff just for a few tens of milliseconds to buy us essentially the time to get the signal further than just 100 kilometers right so this is a little bit in a nutshell how we want to do that these are the first baby steps this is like you know the uh, the web designing the web in 1980 right so this is where we are at the moment I'm sure there's a lot of mistakes we're going to do on the run but we really want to make it happen and the British government is very interested in the tactile internet because UK is very skill set driven it's a skill set driven country so if they could export the skills they have without leaving the actual country would be of massive value add to the economy all right, so we have been philosophizing a little bit on how to, how to make it. Now let's talk a little bit on how to make it happen. So we need to, th we need to abandon uh, some of the thinkings and technology. So I, talk I talked a little bit about some of that. One other thing we need to do very quickly is we need to entirely revamp the cellular network. That's really needed because delays in the cellular network is just too large. Very few will know this, but you know, the... Uh, the, uh, the cell network, how it is constructed, I'd shown this earlier. So you, you, from your mobile phone, it goes to the base station on the roof. From the base station, it goes to a, a serving gateway. And then it goes to the packet gateway. And the serving and packet gateway are often now the same box on the same rack, right? So they're not anymore distributed in the country. They're the same rack. And they're not so many. So a company like Vodafone for LTE has five in the entire UK. So if I'm in Scotland, and uh, I'm on a Vodafone data plan and I want to call somebody on an EE data plan and he's maybe just next door, my signal travels all the way down to the south of England, goes out of my operator's network, goes back on the other, other operator's network, back, back to Scotland, so just we can synchronize that uh, person's next door. doesn't make sense, right? But this is how we have constructed these networks. So we need injection points at the edges. Uh, in fact, I've been advocating for getting rid of the core altogether. Okay, we don't need the core, frankly speaking. Um, I've, 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 uh, I've been advocating this now for two or three years. I've been uh, given quite a lot of headache, but people are warming up to this. People are warming up to this, and I think at some point they will understand that whilst the functionalities of the core, like billing, mobility management, authentication, are fantastic, we want to keep them, but we can virtualize them, the actual infrastructure, the actual core infrastructure is a big luggage, which we don't need. And we have the core in 5G because we had it in 4G, right? And we had it in 4G because we had it in 3G. And we had it in 3G because we had it in 2G. And we had it in 2G because at that time, nobody believed that the internet, which we were just building, you remember, was good enough to carry all the video and voice traffic. That's the actual reason we have the core network. It was a dedicated pipe which the operator could control during times when we had no knowledge on how the infrastructure would work out. That's why we have it. It's a legacy baggage. We don't need it anymore. And you understand we don't need it anymore because if you try to make a video call on, or even a normal call on your phone in London, central London, I've dropped calls like, you know, every, every, uh, every tenth call is when I succeed. Listen to this, right? So whilst when I do a Skype call on my Wi-Fi, it just works. Sometimes it hangs, but it works. Okay, so you tell me who has the quality of service capability here. And it's all down to the core, right? So therefore, we need to get rid of this as quickly as we can, or thin it at least. And it doesn't mean loss of business to giants like uh, Ericsson. It doesn't mean uh, loss of business to giants like uh, Vodafone and uh, EE, et cetera, or Verizon. In fact, it means a massive scalability of business because whilst you lose some business in the core, um, you get suddenly so much more business on the edge because it will scale so much quicker.
right? That's really where the value is. And people start to wake up to that. So let's see how that works. What's the other thing we need to do is um, we need to transform standards. Things are too slow. Uh, we're being promised that you know, as we go down the generation salad from 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, uh, things will get quicker. It's not true. It still takes a long time. And it takes a long time because it's complex, right? To build a system uh, as complex as the cellular system, which works globally, no matter whether you're in Australia or in, 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 in Brno or in the UK, it's, uh, it's a massive achievement. But clearly it means everybody needs to talk to everybody, right? So the handset manufacturers, uh, authentication, billing, e -node B, serving gateway, packet gateway security, everybody has to agree, and this is what takes 10 years. Um, and we are the only community left on the planet which works like that. I call that the iceberg approach, right? So if you try to innovate on this, imagine you're a startup, you just want to start your business. What do you find? You find this. You don't even know how to talk to 3GBP. You don't even know what to do with that, right? It's just big and clunky and slow. It's very good, but this is what it is. So what we need, we need a transformation to what I call the Pandora worlds of standards, right? Uh, a bit like the internet works today. You don't see Intel, uh, Microsoft, and Facebook sit together every 10 years to come up with the next uh, internet. You don't hear that, right? You don't hear 3G internet or 4G internet because everybody is essentially innovating in their Pandora worlds. It's much quicker to scale. They standardize the interfaces, and this is how it works. So if we could have that transition from here to here in the cellular world, we will be very, very competitive, very competitive, okay? So this needs to happen, and first signs are coming. So Etsy is experimenting now with crowdsourcing of standards, which I find very, very interesting. Uh, flip of business models, okay? Things are changing. So the, uh, the traditional business model is very simple. This is us consumers. We are making phone calls. Uh, we are the clients to the, uh, to the telco operators. The telco operators use vendors' equipment like Ericsson, Nokia, etc. And then that trickles down the supply chain, right? So that's a little bit the, the way how it works. But two massive changes are happening. Um, the first change is that the vendors are actually starting to invade the uh, operator space. And the uh, operators are actually invading the over-the-top uh, content delivery space, right? So the ones of the Netflix. So let me explain the first one. So to deliver services like Netflix, etc., you need to stream a lot of stuff. And uh, if you want to stream it out of a server which is somewhere on the other side of the world, there's a long delay, right? And the data pipes of the Atlantic cannot keep with that. So what they do is they cache that information somewhere closer to the user. So they wouldn't cache it right in your mobile, the whole Netflix database. They wouldn't cache it right on the data on the roof, but they would cache it in a city like Brno. So Brno, I could imagine, if Netflix is up and running in this country, would have a dedicated Netflix server which stores all the content of the company. So whenever somebody in Brno and around Brno wants to use Netflix, instead of going to the US and stream it from there, they would stream it locally. But this means uh, Netflix needs to rent real estate, uh, service, cloud infrastructure. Who has it? The telco operators have it. So suddenly, they're back into the business, but now offering their infrastructure not to the consumers, but to the businesses. So instead of being a B2C, a pure B2C company, a business to consumer, they become also a B2B company, which is a shift, gives it a little hedging on the business models. So that's quite interesting. And the vendors are playing something very interesting now. Um, with the IoT, with the machine type of communications, they are focusing on, on different clients. So their clients not necessarily is anymore uh, Vodafone, or Verizon, their clients is maybe Skanska, NSL, Swarco. I don't think you've ever heard of these companies, but these are companies which are giants. They're 10 times bigger than all the other companies we know. Uh, they do real things, they build buildings, they lay roads, they put parking machines, right? So these type of com companies which need things to be instrumented. So once Ericsson, let's say, strikes a deal with a company like Skanska, which is the world, one of the world's biggest construction companies, to say, I'll take care of all the critical instrumentation of your bridges, buildings, tunnels, whatever you have, then they're locked in. They're locked in because Skanska will not go with anybody else. They will just go with Ericsson. And then Ericsson is in a very strong position because before they have been uh, played uh, against the Nokias and the Huawei's uh, to, get, to offer the best deal to the operators, now they can reverse it. They can actually go to the operators and say, who gives me the best data deal? Right? Now they're playing essentially the Vodafones and the EEs and the Verizons against each other. So we are now seeing an ecosystem which is starting to merge and intertwine, which is good because it gives us a lot of stability. We call that an investment hedging, 
right? We're hedging our opportunities. We don't put our egg in a single basket. So this is what's happening at the moment um, on the planet. A lot of shifts, a lot of stuff in the background. Big question is, would the consumer care about this? Okay, do they really like this? So I, I like to keep it real ever since I start my company. So what I, I do usually when I start something new, I go out uh, and ask people. So I went to the streets of um, London and I asked people, uh, what do you think about the tactile internet? Would you use it? Something new, right? They're not used to that. So I described it to them what it is, uh, that nobody was briefed, so they're all people, and nobody knew about it. I, I told them what it is, and they gave me a response. So it's a sh it's, I cut it down, I have quite a little bit more footage. But uh, here you go. Okay, so I'll leave you with that. You see the internet, what the tactile internet will be used at some point. Uh, it's probably to keep just peace and prosperity uh, on this planet. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. It's a, everything comes down to demand, right? So we see that a lot with the Internet of Things. So we have a total oversupply of technologies. We have a total oversupply of standards, total oversupply of business models which work on the Internet. There's a need. There's no demand, right? Need doesn't mean demand. So it takes, the Internet took a long time to gel as well. It took like 20 years, right? So we had PowerPoint as early, I can't remember, maybe 1995, but there was no demand. For, there was a need for that, right? Already back then, but there was no demand. And now everybody's using that. So therefore, you know, to reach the uh, demand point is the most critical thing in new markets. And this is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an iterative game, right? So people, and this is when trust really will be built. So it doesn't mean the technology is more trustworthy uh, now than it was 10 years ago. But as people start to get used to that, start to use their see the peers are using it, etc., uh, we start building trust. Of course, you don't need to you, you, you need to make sure you don't screw up with security stuff, etc. But often it's just really a slow process, a bit like a good wine, right? It takes time to uh, it takes time essentially to come along, and that's that's really what we see. And I I think the internet thing we need another two three years until demand really kicks off, and. Um, for all the companies who are now in the Internet of Things space, the biggest problem is to bridge you know, their cash flow until then. Because in my company, I need to pay 50 people their salary every month. And uh, you know, orders come in, but it's not like, it's not like that. So uh, if we survive until 2018, then we're good. Uh, but not everybody does. So our American competitors uh, just closed last uh, May, uh, May, a few months back. They spent $65 million on creating demand. 
right? That's what they did, and they didn't manage, which was good for us because we didn't have to do it. So, um, so sometimes you just have to give time to technology, not panic, right? So we're looking now for recipes. Why is the IoT not happening, or why is augmented reality not happening? Just give it time. That's it. Think of the the wine. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. So we need to ask uh, investors to be patient. <laughs> yeah, basically, yes. So we are not in panic, but they are not. Yeah, but you know, I'll give you the example. Nest, for instance. Uh, do you know Nest? Right? Nest is this American company, the thermostat, which was built by, bought by Google for $3.2 billion. Unbelievable. Uh, their sales have stopped. There's no way. Typically, a company in a high growth phase, uh, their valuation is 10 times the revenue. There's no way that Nest was doing 320 million the year they were bought. There's no way, right? The same with Samsung who bought uh, Smart Things, I think, for $200 million. Uh, there's no way they were doing revenues of 20 million. They're strugg Everybody is struggling, right? It's a lot of hype. A lot of these acquisitions were political or were talent acquisitions, etc. cetera. Um, so we need to wait. It will come. Sorry, yes. Thank you, Misha, for uh, the very inspirational talk. So, um, I would uh, more make uh, like a comment, and uh, I don't yeah. know if you will agree with me. Okay. Uh, when I saw tactile, it reminds me of the tactile screens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is like uh, pushing further the tactile instead of 2D. Yeah. Like in front of you, yeah. you're distributing the touch. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and as you say, you, you give a nice historical like overview uh, of the internet. Now I see that the kids, if you if you if you talk to them, uh, they don't. Want anymore the computers with uh, keyboard? Yeah. They're like uh, yeah. it's too boring yeah. if, if the screen is not tactile. Yeah. So this is like pushing the the, 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 the boundaries, yeah. and I think it's it's very promising, and it, it gave me a little bit of uh, like inspiration to, to think further. And as you say, we are making the baby steps now. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I wanted to comment is more on the, on this G. I was always very critical even at the time I was working at Nokia. Mm. On the, how, how do we put the next G? So we have one G and then two G, and then uh, the, the step between one G and two G was was really great. But then two G, three G, okay, we get internet, and then we just started to increase speed. Mm -hmm. But here we, we we get something something uh, uh, like more. So so it's not only the speed, mm -hmm. but we get mm -hmm. uh, the whole change of the concept. So that's why I like the the the, the idea, and uh, I'm uh, like. Uh, very happy that probably I attended one of the first talks. You know, <laughs> yeah, we'll see how this plays out. I mean, you know, the, the generations, the names of 2G, 3G, 4G is not given by uh, 3GBP itself, right? So they talk about releases, as you know, release 13, release 14. It's more the market which yeah, decides, right? So 4G was not supposed to be 4G. Uh, according to our understanding, engineering understanding, was supposed to be 3.9G. The true 4G was supposed to be a carrier application, which is coming now. Okay, so but now the market has decided we want to talk about 5G already, but 3 gbp will not go into this. So they will, as you know, right? So they will talk release 13, 14, 15, etc. So, yeah, we'll see. And we'll see how this plays out, really, um, um, in terms of the cellular releases. Uh, yeah, every generation. So I was joking with Gerhard actually. You have a good point that you know there's there's a lot of similarity between the generations. And uh, I have a running uh, joke with Gerd Fetva is that I'll be able to give a 5G keynote using 3G slides and nobody will notice, okay? <laughs> I haven't done it with you, I <laughs> promise that. Uh, I could do, easily, no, because it's always like factor 10, factor 100, right? If you don't put absolute values, just relative values, same thing. Which somehow is a good thing, because we're on the road which we understand, it gives continuity. Uh, but we have new things, like the machine type communication, and you, the next keynote speaker will probably talk quite a lot about this, the new features, and I think that's really, really exciting. And it's an exciting opportunity because the other community screwed up. Okay, if they had done it well, uh, we wouldn't be talking about uh, MTC in 3GPP, I don't think so. But they haven't, so there's an opportunity, there's an opportunity window right now. Yeah, okay. There's another question. Do you have one mic? Yeah, sorry, I will run that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, from time to time, we hear a lot of um, devices being hacked, applications being hacked, services being hacked. In your opinion, does the security and Internet of Things differ? Yeah, so we have, uh, we struggled. We struggled quite a lot. So actually, I work quite a lot on security, so I was the when I was in Orange, I was the founding member of um, etcm 2 m 
and we worked quite a lot on the security specs, and I was also the one responsible for one of the alliance waveness. Every time I wrote all of this in the security specs. So the first thing what we found is if, if you want to secure things, you can secure things to a certain point, at least on a link. On a cryptographic by basis, um, it's okay. We have all the, uh, unless there are some back holes from the NSA, we don't know, but let's assume this is all sound. Uh, we do have the cryptographic means of doing that as long as your packet is long enough so you can run an AS128 on top, right? And the key exchange, etc., is all, all done. So in theory, you can do it. What we found is very intriguing, and where we hear now a lot of the security hacks happening is this, that the default configuration is left uh, as such. And default often in the old days was no security. And the reason was default no security is because the engineers wanted to test things quickly in the field, right? So you come in in the home or in the city, you deploy quickly some stuff, and you want to test it very quickly. You don't want to change security keys on all these things. So the default configuration of all the devices that they come out of factory is no security. So the, theoretically, the engineers should have been then put, once the testing's been done, they should put back the security, which is there, different security levels, right? But they often forget. So therefore, the old legacy stuff is actually totally unsecured simply because the engineers were lazy, right? There was no design error. Um, but let's move on a little bit. So IT systems are very complex, right? So once you get a high degree of complexity, uh, there are possibly a lot of different doors which you don't see unless you run some formal verifications. But we have some of the world's leading formal verification guys at King's and they tell me it's, it's, it's basically hopeless, right? So it's a very, very difficult to verify a whole system. So I'm not talking about the link. I'm not talking about a network. I'm talking about literally the whole thing, taking databases into kind of the user experience. So yeah, we're struggling with that. And the other thing is with this, with the computer, right? You have something to talk to. If you feel there's something wrong, you close it, you switch it off, you change it, yeah? With the sensors, you don't know. Even you have stuff in your home, it doesn't have a display, it doesn't have a keyboard, there's no way to, to hack. So the trust issue comes there, do you trust that? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? You see, so we, 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 we are struggling with that and uh, we'll see how this comes along. So I think until we kind of, you know, we could crack into this machine, but people generally don't do it, okay? And with the wireless sensor networks, we just need to, and the IoT, we need to hope it will, there will not be too many negative cases. There will be, there's no doubt, um, because you can't really provide 100% security, but it's, in theory it's doable. But there are some challenges. Like if you work in security, for instance, short packets. So uh, Sigfox, I mentioned one of the uh, systems. Sigfox has very short packets, just a few bytes long. How do, you, how do you encrypt that in a very reliable way? We don't know, okay? Quantum, we don't know how to prepare this stuff because these, this, this computer, when quantum computer comes along, I can change the computer, no problem. Sensors are rolled out, you have maybe billions of sensors rolled out. Uh, you can't just go and change that, right? So how do you prepare sensors you roll out today for possible quantum attacks uh, eight years down the road? So these are the challenges we work on at the moment as well. Not me personally, but within Kings and the UK. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Oh. <laughs> I need to synchronize. Them. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise. Uh, I think it's it's yeah. the biggest exercise you've done for days. Oh, like that's the biggest yeah. one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, uh, I'm Bustian from the uh, University of Ljubljana. I work um, mainly on uh, optical uh, physical layer, so I have a question uh, which is related with this. <coughs> you mentioned uh, Netflix and uh, also the YouTube that they are building the local uh, data centers. Sure, yeah. So, do you think that the high bit rate traffic there is moving uh, from the long haul, haul to the ones, to yeah. the to the metro or yeah, even to metro, the access? Yeah. Yeah. If we will have the distributed cloud yeah. to the uh, yeah. users, yes, I think that's that's a trend. That's really the trend, and and um, it's simply because the volume of data being shipped forth and back is just really enormous. It's like unbelievable. So, um, but I think for the optics, so we we talked recently a lot of so optics on my field, but you know we we design what we call the cloud run. So the idea is essentially that the base station which you have on your roof does not contain any intelligence as such, right? Or very limited. And all the intelligence would be somewhere else in a, in a cloud kind of area. And that's called the cloud radio access network. And to communicate from your base station to that cloud thing, you need fiber, which needs to be like this. So we use protocols like chip read, etc. Um, so we need to, we need big optical fibers there. So clearly there's a lot of research still to be done there. Um, and um, what else? 
from a caching point of view, just want to explain something interesting. So we work with uh, the center of work, Nishan Sastri. He worked quite a lot with the BBC. So the BBC has something like uh, Netflix. It's called iPlayer. So they would essentially some of their shows. They would cut, they would keep them on their on their cloud for a while. Um, the problem was is now the K, everybody's coming home at seven o'clock, right? More or less the same time, switching on TV, <laughs> starting to watch more or less the same thing. So suddenly the traffic which came out of BBC service has gone through the roof. And they're paying, of course, the ISP for the peak traffic, okay? So then uh, Nishan came up with some really intelligent predictive algorithms. So they he would be able to say more or less when you come home and what you're going to watch without you actually knowing, right? You yourself don't know, right? But uh, he knew. And then the idea was essentially to pre-cache that stuff, not only in the metropolitan area, but actually on your TV set, or on your mobile phone. Okay, so during non-peak time, like let's say noon, when everybody's having lunch, whatever, uh, you would essentially download a lot of stuff which you think will be pertinent in the evening. And uh, with that, we managed to bring down traffic almost to zero. And uh, so, you know, if you put in a little bit of intelligence, to the hardcore, uh, hardcore engineering approach, then suddenly it becomes really interesting. Yeah, it's just a sideline, really. So, yeah. Thank you. So, do you think that when my neighbor come home and he is going to watch the same show, yeah, my, uh, the traffic from my TV is going to yeah. his TV locally? Yeah. So this would be ideal. <laughs> and we had a it's good it's good point, right? So yeah, so this peer to peer stuff worked really well actually I generally. Don't, yeah. Yeah, like a torrent thing. So uh, Nishan worked on this and he said that would be the best configuration where it lowers it even lower. But companies like Netflix, uh, there's no way, right? So we, we know the uh, lead architect of Netflix quite well and uh, uh, they are very protective about their stuff. So there's not going to be any peer-to-peer -peer with the serious streaming companies, yeah. So for me it's important to develop the high capacity access. Yes, yes, you still have, <laughs> yeah, go for it. We need you, yes. Okay. No, I think really fiber, without fiber, nothing will run on this planet, so, yeah. Any questions from the other side? <laughs> 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 I will collect one in there. Thanks. Okay, when, yeah, since you are still thinking, um, I got a question to okay. you. And, uh, uh, but you have to walk here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well then this part will ask you. So, uh, on behalf of this part, I'm asking you a question about the uh, market opportunities for all the technologies you are designing now. So we have uh, clear estimates on uh, IoT, on 5G, but tactile. Mm -hmm. Have you come across with anything like that? Yeah, so we work with the British government business, the, uh, the Department of Business Innovation and Skills. So we worked on the business case for that. So if, uh, of course, it's very rough, right? You're yeah, just yeah, estimating. But we, we had, rough in estimations. Yeah, so we estimate some, uh, I think it was 10% 10, 10 of the world's GDP. Yeah, it's a lot of money. It's above the carbon economy, so it's above oil and gas at their peak time. So wow. it's a lot of money, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, we are researchers. We want money from no, the government, so we exaggerate. But um, who knows, right? So it's, if that works, so we can't do everything with that. There are limits to that technology. But um, if, if you start offering you know, your skills as a service, in a sense, it becomes really, really interesting. Yeah. So you yeah. think that it will keep us busy for 10 years? Yeah. I think everybody, because and what I love most about this, this is not only a telco design. This yeah. is like a design where I can use, you know, my center for robotics next yeah, door yeah. and my center for artificial intelligence, and uh, even law. We have technology lawyers because you know the kind of so it becomes a really cross disciplinary design issue, really, yeah. and uh, it's just fascinating. So just a new enabler. So, yeah, 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 about fourteen percent yeah. of GDP. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Not bad, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> huge, huge. Even one percent is huge. Yeah. All right, so if no questions from that side, so I will just you know, <laughs> take this opportunity and ask another question. You are the visioner. You are. Tell me, 2050. I mean, which direction we have to go after tactile internet? I mean, what's, what's next? <laughs> so if you want to read it, really, I, before I answer that, right? Um, you should read a book called The Next 100 Years. So it was written by an American who is, um, it's all about politics, not technology, right? But technology plays a big part of that book. So, um, and he argues that whilst you can't do microscopic predictions, right? We don't know exactly who's doing, going to be doing what. But um, mac macroscopically, um, following the cycles of uh, nations, humanity, etc., he thinks he can predict what's going to happen until the end of the century. And he wrote the book at the beginning of this century, and he predicted the Arab uprising, 
Uh, he predicted basically everything which is happening now. The strengthening of Turkey, the strengthening of Mexico, the uh, strengthening of Japan. Uh, it is a really fascinating reading. It's just unbelievable. Um, so he predicts the United States. Uh, are there any Americans in this room? Uh, no, so, so okay, good, yeah. Yeah, so, no, yeah, it's on camera, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm conscious of that. No, but I just wanted to say, so he, it's really fast. He argues that America will lose its uh, global dominance after 2050, that uh, Mexico will actually take a very, very strong, uh, um, a very strong role in the area. And from a technology point of view, um, yeah, so a lot of stuff will happen in space, 2050, okay? And uh, clearly we'll need other, other type of technologies there to make things happen. Sure. And I think the whole satellite type of and space explorative type of stuff will just come back. And then maybe the tactile net research we do today, which is this combination of autonomous robotics with some edge intelligence and some comms capabilities, will become really, really interesting. I don't know, yeah, so I, I think that will really play the role. Then also I think, you know, the whole nano stuff will be up and running by 2050. So we talked about this yesterday in the car. So we look at this now in, in Kings. The Kings College line is very good in medical research, cancer research. So the idea is to have essentially small, very small nano entities uh, stay with a wireless controller, go through your bloodstreams, inject precision medicine into the cancer, etc. Uh, this type of stuff, right? So from the, the nanos, nanoscale, but really controlled, not just on a paper, but really made an engineering solution out of this. And then the whole space stuff, I think these are the two. The two domains. If we make it until 2050, oh, yeah, right? Absolutely. So there you go. Absolutely. Yeah. Enjoy Carpe Diem, right? That's yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, so I think that we are a little bit running out of time, but this is perfectly fine. So you're leaving at three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.